Okay, it's now recording. Thanks. Okay, so uh, now going to the last part of the class. Okay, so we saw first um, where uncertainty comes from. Okay, then we saw how we can uh, incorporate it into our uh, simulation analysis and uh, how we can uh, understand the, the risk curve, uh, what is risk and what is upside risk, what's, uh, sorry, what's downside risk and what's upside potential. Okay, we saw how all of that. Now we're going to the last part, which is, uh, I think the, the most difficult part is, okay, I understood all that. I, I mapped my uncertainties. I understood the effects on my NPV, but what can I do with that? Okay, that's the most tricky part. And what's where do we enter into how we can manage uncertainty? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So now we're talking about decision analysis. Okay. Before we've talked about risk analysis. Okay. And again, I'm going to start again with the same question. Or, or uh, actually, I'll just continue. But if you want, you can interrupt me. Uh, risk analysis is not the same as decision analysis. Okay, and sometimes the terms can be used in the literature not so clear. Okay, sometimes people use it the same way. But at least what I have been uh, talking today, it's when I say we, uh, it's about our vision at UNIC. Okay, and sometimes because we are in academia, uh, the ideas we have may be different from the ideas that other research groups you, you, you may see in the literature. So you will not see like everyone thinking exactly the same. Sometimes topics are controversial and so on. So here I'm gi giving you our visions. Okay, so for us, risk analysis and decision analysis are not the same thing. Okay. When you talk risk analysis, what we did before, we understood uncertainties, we quantified uncertainties, we quantified risk, we quantified the potential, we saw the risk curve. Okay, that's risk analysis. So I'm quantifying uncertainty. Now, when you talk about the scene analysis, it's much more complex. Okay, it's a multidisciplinary uh, task. Okay, it involves mathematics, statistics, but also it's what we have not seen yet before so much. It's about also psychology. We are talking about management, science, finance, economics, and other things. Okay, so here, when uh, when we want to okay so we have the effects of uncertainty are assessed okay uncertainty in risk analysis so that decisions can be improved okay they, basically i think this is the most important message that i want to convey you we we do all these studies on uncertainty quantification and risk analysis so that we can make good decisions okay because if if i just go and understand okay i quantified my risk and i do nothing with that my, my study had no purpose, okay? All we do in, in reservoir engineering is that so we can have better decisions, okay? So when we talk about managing uncertainty, and that's why the importance of using managing uncertainty and not mitigating uncertainty is that we want to mitigate the risks, okay? We want to identify the risks so we can have actions to mitigate them, okay? Mitigate is like to minimize, I do not want, I want to prevent that, okay? I'm going to do everything I can so that in the case that actually the reservoir is a more pessimistic value, the volumes are much lower than we anticipated, the, the fluid flow is not as I anticipated, I can have actions in place so I can not lose as much money and I can take the most out of that scenario. I think that it's the, the best way to look at it. I will take the most out of each situation okay if i'm a pessimistic model how can i do the best i can in that case and so on okay so we are going to identify risks so that we can identify actions to mitigate the risks okay but also in this analysis we want to identify opportunities okay so we can also identify actions to exploit them okay so in case i have like um, a more optimistic uh, value i want to understand okay my decision that i'm doing today in a more of a conservative way so that I don't not so exposed to big losses, in case of a passive optimistic value of my reservoir, will I be able to capture that or will I just lose the chance because I, I, I had no action in place to capture that, okay? So you want to understand the, the uncertainty as something not as bad, but also something as good, okay? We want to understand what is the problem that I want to mitigate and what is the opportunity that I want to exploit, okay? Uh, and uh, this is what I've said already, basically, risk analysis has no value okay, if decision makers do not find actions to manage uncertainty and improve decisions. Basically, it's the whole goal of the study is to make better decisions. Okay, So basically, 
uh, the, the DA in petroleum field development is complex, okay, as we saw. Just summing up, we have multiple sources of uncertainties, reservoir, economic, and operational, and others, okay. Uh, these three that I cite here are not the exclusive sources of uncertainty. These are the ones that we usually treat in, in our group, okay, in reservoir engineering, but we can have many other uncertainties, okay. And as we said, okay, we have to cope with the uncertainties and we have to understand that we have these multiple decision variables that we need to choose, which is a production strategy, okay. So basically, um, uh, okay, one, this is also an important uh, parenthesis, not so much the focus of today, but basically, as we saw here, the, it can be very subjective, right? What's risky, what's opportunity, uh, what, uh, what's risky for someone uh, cannot, can be attractive for someone else, okay? So that's why the decision analysis is such a complex process and it involves uh, psychology and so on, because you need to understand that there is subjectivity, and many times we have the professional experience that is based in decisions, but we also need to understand how can we minimize the effects of the decision biases, okay? So the effects of the personal, of the human bias in decisions so that we can exploit uh, the best out of our resources that we can, okay? And this is still really the focus of research. Okay, so again, the risk curve we've seen before, okay? With the benchmark here, now I put it in the more, more round value, one billion. Okay, then before it was just a mistake. Uh, so I've talked about mitigate risk and upside, uh, exploit upside. So when you, our focus is on mitigating downside risk, I'm focused on this side of the curve. Okay, so if my focus is on mitigating risk. I've, I've defined risk as a, all that it's below the, the my targeted return. Okay, so it's below here. And so I'm, my goal here is that I don't want this curve to go this end. I want to improve the curve and sh shift it to the right, okay? But when, I'm, when I do this, uh, I can, I have to accept that this may happen, okay? So an example is what? Uh, I, instead of investing in such a big platform, okay, I will choose a smaller platform. So in case of pessimistic values, I don't lose that much money. But if the if my, my my reservoir turns out to be much more optimistic than I uh, than I suspect, uh, my my production unit will not be able to, to process all the available resources. Okay, and so I will be losing money in this side. Okay, so depending on, on the target of the decision maker, and this comes again the profile of the company, the profile of the or the portfolio of the company, and so on. Uh, there is no right answer to what we want to do. Okay, so if this happens, we can see this happening. But if the, the, the idea is to exploit the upsides, okay, so here I want to enlarge the tail of my risk curve, okay, so I want to capture all the mess I can for my pessimist, for my optimistic um, scenarios, this can happen. So again, in the, in, looking again at the example of the platform, I can go ahead for a much bigger platform. So in case of there is an optimistic value, I can exploit all the resources. Uh, but in case of in a, a more pessimistic value uh, of, of my, my reservoir, uh, I will be losing much more money, right? So basically the difference between the curves, maybe I'm not sure if I was clear to you, is the decision variables, okay? So I have the same scenario, but I'm changing the platform or I'm changing the well number. So I'm changing the production strategies. So production strategy is very broad, okay? It, it, it includes everything, okay? It's the way you will be producing your reservoir, okay? So it includes everything. So I will be changing something of my decisions, okay? And we'll ch change the shape of my curve, okay? Here I'm not, because I cannot control my reservoir scenarios. The, given the, the, the current information I have today, this is the best I can, I can characterize them, okay? So with this set of scenarios. So, but what I can do is that I can make the most of my decision which is a production strategy, so that I can shape the curve to uh, something that is more in line with the goals of the company, right? So here I want to, to, to bring the, 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 the closed loop uh, concept, okay, which I, I, I'm sure you've seen before in the classes. Uh, and the idea here uh, is that uh, the guideline using the, the closed loop concept is a very 
good way, like in, especially in Professor Dennis, he has made 12 steps, as I'm sure you have seen before as well. It's a very good way to help us to go through this process of quantifying uncertainty, risk analysis and decision analysis, okay? So basically our focus here is on the in this blue part, okay? It's a life cycle optimization, okay? And the long-term decisions. Uh, but this part is so important, okay, as you have seen, okay, so all this range of uncertainties and so on come from here, okay, so those guys that work here with uh, all the data and constructed the models will give us the information, okay, they will say, okay, this is the best knowledge we have today, now can you optimize our production strategy and choose what we can do best giving this knowledge, okay, and again, it's also the, the, the red part here because as we get more data, we need to update our models and to assimilate the data to, so we can reduce uncertainties, okay? And so this is so important that we, because if this is wrong, everything I do in the blue parts is wrong too, okay? So I need to make sure that my models are as good as possible and as we can, so we can have good decisions, okay? Basically, bringing the, the, the 12 steps that I, I, I think we can, uh, tell it as a, 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 a framework to guide like the engineers and the practitioners to make decisions, okay? You've seen that too. And what I want to show here is that the focus of this class today, so it's what I highlighted here, okay? So basically, risk analysis with, with, would, would come from these main steps, okay? Reservoir characterization, okay? The scenarios you have generated using Latin hypercube sampling and initial risk analysis, so the first risk, okay, as we saw today. Now we have a whole world of steps, okay, which is what I'm going to talk now, uh, that tell us how can we optimize our production strategy given the uncertainties and how can I make these uh, good decisions uh, looking at how I can manage this uncertainty, okay? So these are the, the mo most important steps for today, okay? Uh, basically, and if we see this as also a, a stepwise approach so we can have everything, when we go to the step eight, like because it's what I'm going to talk now, representative models. This we have some all of these inputs uh, for our approach here. So basically, for me, I always work with these steps. Okay, so we have other uh, um, people that are uh, um, have expertise in in other areas, like for reservoir characterization and data simulation. I can take all that data and use it as input data for my analysis, risk analysis, and uncertainty. Uh, and decision analysis, okay? So basically I have from step one, the uncertain attributes with their ranges and probabilities. I got from step four, the multiple scenarios, okay? I combined these using the, the Latin hypercube sampling as we have seen, okay? Then it's important to go through step five, okay? Which is the data simulation from Celius lecture, okay? We need to make sure that all the data, all the scenarios I generate are consistent with all the data we have available, okay? And then uh, we have the initial risk analysis, okay? And then we can go to what we call representative models, okay? Uh, before going into the representative models, I brought this slide here just to, um, it's, it's like a summary of what we have talked before, okay? Just in a, in a different picture, okay? So basically, we have talked about the scenario, which is a particular combination of all uncertain attributes, okay? We have seen all of these. We have the justice correlation, we have the fluid data, rock fluid data, and so on, which one is the PDF, like in this example, okay? We call these system inputs, okay? This inputs, why? Because they input our simulator, right? Let's talk like that, okay? They are all the input data I can use uh, related to my uncertain reservoir system. And we use the, the Latin hypercube sampling, the discretized Latin hypercube sampling with just statistics that be the accurate name, uh, and to create what we call an ensemble. An ensemble is like a group or a set of scenarios, okay? So this is just bringing again the, some new terms, which is system inputs, which is something that I will be talking about sometimes, and also ensemble, these are important terms. And ensemble is also very widely used in, in, in the reservoir engineering literature. Okay, uh, when we, we talk about uncertainty representation, so we have the scenarios, okay, which we call the system inputs because they go in, into the our reservoir, reservoir simulator plus the economic calculator, okay, it can be a spreadsheet, can be 
for example, for you guys that will be working in our project, you will use Mero, like, uh, which is an internal software from Unisi. Okay, so you have all these inputs, uh, all these uh, tools, okay, the reservoir simulator and the economic calculator, and you have system outputs. We call outputs because they are the output of the reservoir simulation, okay? And we have here the, the time series, okay, for NP, recovery factor, I have the risk curves and so on. When I talk about uncertainties and we want to uh, study um, in risk analysis and decision analysis, we want to understand this part, okay, but also this part, okay, you need to understand both parts simultaneously, okay, uh, because this is, well, the knowledge we have today, and this is the combination of the knowledge we have today plus the decision we make, okay, so this is what we want to capture, and we call this system inputs and this system outputs, okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm, these slides seem a little bit disconnected, but I'm, I'm, I hope they will make sense in, in a short, okay? Uh, I'm he bringing here parentheses on percentiles, okay? Uh, before going into representative models, this percentile slide is, is important because of that. Uh, before going to representative models, I wanted to talk about this. So basically, percentiles is something that is very used in different areas, for example, in exploration, as we saw in the beginning of the class, in the booking of reserves, some of you may also be familiar with this concept, okay? So the valuation of an oil company is based on the, on the reserves, the oil and gas reserves they have booked, okay? And to book those reserves, okay, you need to follow some criteria, okay? That is a guideline by the SPE. Um, and you need to follow uh, this, this uh, concept of, um, that I've shown here, which is the proved reserves, which is where we have the most certainty, we have the proof plus probable reserves, which we call the 2P or P50, and we have the 3P, which is proof plus probable plus possible reserves, okay? Which is includes the also the optimistic. So you go from the most pessimistic or the most conservative, I would say not so pessimistic, but more conservative estimate, you have the most likely estimate, which includes the pessimistic or the uh, conservative plus the probable and so on. So this concept is very used in these in these uh, two domains, exploration and the booking of reserves. But when we go to uh, reservoir engineering, where it's a much more complex modeling of, of, of the problem, uh, the, the use of these percentiles, which are very widely used, and but I think they are kind of losing their use with time, uh, they are not so... Um, useful to us because they reflect only one risk curve and a percentile it means that we have at least 90 percent chance to get that value or more okay so when i say that my my, my p90 is this value i mean that i'm at least 90 percent um, probability to have this value here let's say uh, a rounding to 500 million a little bit less than that but okay uh, when you talk about the P50, is that I have uh, a 50% chance to get at least 1,000 uh, million or a little bit over 1 billion, okay? When I talk about the P10, I have 10 probability, 10 probability of uh, having at least 2 billion. So I have very low probability to, have to reach this value. That's why we use, and also again, a parenthesis that we use the, 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 the complementary commutative distribution, so in this shape, and some of you have seen it plotted in the other way, okay, like this, uh, because in this way, the reading of the percentiles, it's much easier, okay, to, then we have the risk curve plotted the other way, okay. The problem is that for you guys that are more familiar with the percentiles, but if, if you want to understand more, I can also explain the problem, um, is that the P90 is selected for this indicator. So I'm not sure if I go to NP or recovery factor or so on, if my indicator is, if the P90 is the same for them, okay? So these are only uh, a photograph of one indicator. But as we said, we want that our models capture everything. So the, this dimension of the problem and this dimension of the problem. So if I go and I use a P50, P90 and P10, I'm, I, I will be very biased in my in my selection of, of these indicators. It will only be for, for NPV. That's why the concept of representative model was developed. Okay, I have here a, a reference from 2019, but it's actually, we have 
uh, it's 2020, it's, uh, in, it, it was not in press, it was also published, but uh, basically the idea is that the representative model concept comes from a long time ago. The first publication from Professor Dennis was in 2004, okay? The idea is that we are not wanting to just select three or four percentiles that are good for one indicator, but we want to have uh, representative models that capture all the system inputs and outputs that cover the entire spread of the risk curve, okay? So this was a concept that was generated, uh, was first published in 2004, so it was probably conceived uh, a long, long before that, and only now in 2020, uh, the first publication at least was in 2016, uh, we, where we have a tool called RM Finder, where we could uh, finally automate this idea of uh, representative models, okay? So basically we go from this idea where we have a classic approach based on percentiles, where we only choose, only looking at only one single risk curve, okay? And I go and choose three uh, percentiles or can be more, but the idea that it's only looking at one very specific part of the problem. And we go to these advanced scenario reduction methods where we look at the entire problem, okay? The entire ensemble, and both the input and the outputs of the system, okay? And we have two main approaches, okay, to treat this problem that we'll see in the literature, okay? Uh, one is uh, focus on geological uncertainty. So the, the idea is that we have those, that, those big uh, set of geostatistical realizations, okay? They are not in uh, a scope of a scenario yet. We are just looking at the, the geostatistical realizations. And uh, we want to select a few of them that can represent the variability of the large set, okay? So this is one idea, and some people in the literature have been treating this. At UNEC, we have been working more on the side of representative simulation models, where now we're talking about scenarios. I want to select scenarios, where a scenario is no longer just one uncertain attribute, just synchronizations, but it's everything together. Okay, so basically, as I said, the first idea came from 2004, the first publication. We have more recent ones. We also currently, uh, Kurosh, one of our postdocs, has been working a lot on this concept, but it's kind of still new for uh, UNICI at least. We have developed much more, uh, many more methods uh, looking at the RMs. Um, First, uh, I have more information, but first I want to make sure that it's clear to everyone. Uh, if I went too fast, if I want, if you want to for me to come back, if you need me to explain something, if you want to talk in Portuguese, it's also okay. I see no questions in the chat, so I I'll continue. But please interrupt me at, at any moment. Uh, no, no problem. Okay. Uh, so basically. This idea of RM Finder, okay, is that um, we, we um, when I say we, I'm not talking about personally, I'm talking about NEC. So, uh, Maida, to be precise, with uh, uh, with all the, all the co authors, they developed uh, because they, they this, these professors, they are from the School of Technology, they are very good with optimization. So, they, we, we, again, from the reservoir engineering part, we give them problems. Okay, see, I want to do this. And they are very good with automating things. So we said, okay, I want to find a method that can solve this problem. I, I have this large ensemble of models, like 500 models or 200 models. Uh, I have all these risk curves. I have all these indicators. I want to reduce and select only nine or 10 or this. Okay, and so they developed a method, okay, based on a methodistic optimization algorithm that performs global and local searches. These are details about the method, but that they want to capture what we ask them to do, okay, the PDFs of the certain attributes and the variability of the riskers, okay. Now we are not talking about risk and upsides, okay, we want to capture everything, we want to capture the whole uncertainty because we want to treat that when we go to the, our analysis to also get the, both the downsides and the upsides, okay? So basically, one important thing is that it estimates the probability of my RM. So I go, for example, I have an ensemble of 200 scenarios and my RM finder, the tool selects, as I asked him, nine representative models or 10. 
and it gives us, it estimates the probability of each RM, okay? So basically the input data for RM finder, it's what I said, all those PDFs, all the ranges and so on, and the system outputs, all, all the risk curves and so on, and it treats this as an optimization problem, and it finds a set of models or N sets, as we ask them, uh, to get these models, okay? So this is a, a, another picture, okay, that it represents well. So basically in green, we have the ensemble. In this case, it's around 200 models. And in red, we have the RMs, uh, which uh, are nine in this case. We have, so basically these are, these are examples of uh, data that uh, RM finder uh, analyzes. So this is the PDFs, okay. So in green, we have the PDF of my ensemble and in red, the PDF in my RM. So it's fairly close considering that we are going from 214 models to nine, okay? This is another indicator. Uh, then we have here a cross plot of WP versus NP, here the NPV the, uh, versus recovery factor. We have many other cross plots, so this is just an example. So the, the, the tool looks at it, this uh, uh, scatter plot, a cross plot or scatter plot, they are the same, and it tries to find N models that uh, capture the whole distribution in in the scatter plots, in the risk curves, and in the PDF. So um, obviously it will not be perfect for all indicators. You see here, there are some problems, but given that we are using um, dozens of objective functions with cross plots and so on, uh, it, it has to weigh in like the, the benefit and it finds like the, the uh, stop criteria to get the, the, the good solution. And then it's up to the user to check if, if the solution is good, okay? And why do we take all this trouble to find this uh, nine RM or, or, or 10 or whatever it is? Here is eight in this slide. So we are talking about, we had initially, I said around 200 models. Uh, I wanted to select nine. And the question is why? Why, why not working with 200? Well, it's computationally quite, quite impossible to do optimization for all those scenarios, okay? But also because it's uh, humanly near impossible to analyze with detail 200 models and the production strategy ideal for each one. So that's why we use this concept is that basically, if my, my the basic the hypothesis or the, not about the, the premise that we have here is that if my RMs, they represent my entire uncertain space, if I get one production strategy for each one, I will get a very nice idea of the different ways to develop and manage this reservoir, okay? This is the idea we have. That's why we did all that study using the RMs, all these advanced methods to make sure. And that's why there are many studies in the literature to try to get the best way to reduce the size of the ensemble from those 200 or more scenarios to just a couple of scenarios that the decision maker or the engineer can work with and that it can it's manageable for me to compare a couple of scenarios right and uh, optimize a couple of strategies then to work with 200 models it's, it would be near nearly impossible okay so that is the idea uh, and when you go out about optimization under uncertainty uh, so the idea is that we can have two main uh, ideas to treat the problem we have robust optimization that uh, it's very uh, popular uh, in the literature lately, is that I, at each run, at each time I, um, I'm running optimization, right? my optimizer at each iteration, it samples a certain well placement, right? For example, if I'm optimizing well placement. When I do robust optimization is that I take that well placement that my optimizer sampled and I apply in each one of my RMs I get the NPV for each one of them. I calculate, for example, an EMV, and I my I, my objective function is now a, a probabilistic indicator, right? Because at each run of the optimization, I I estimate the performance of that strategy into all all models simultaneously, and so I will tend to converge, like my optimizer, to a solution that is good on average for all scenarios. So it will not be optimal for anyone, but it will not be very bad for anyone either. 
So it will be a solution that is good for the average of scenarios. And they talk about that, they call that robust optimization or a robust production strategy. The other approach that we have been working a lot at Unisim is the use of well, nominal optimization, or we call RM nominal optimization. We have been talking about determinist optimization, there are many ideas, but the idea is that what you have seen in the previous class of production optimization, you repeat all of that for your N RM. So I take this RM, um, I optimize one optimal strategy that is specifically designed for this model, and I store it. Then I do it all again for all my RMs. And all of this, it's a, a big effort, right? But I can quantify the difference in my, in my decisions. So I have a set of strategies, okay? None of them are uh, are um, are like unlike the robust one. They are like perfect for one or perfect. I mean that the best my computational tools can get. Not nothing is ever perfect and optimal, right? It's the best I can get for my RMs. And so I have here these two different approaches, right? I have here I have a lot of information I can get from these strategies, as I, I will show you in a second. But basically, this is a two kind of approaches, and they are actually quite complementary because the information you get from one, it's very different information you get from the other. And when I mean information is the difference in the similarities between the production strategies. Okay? So as I said, this is just, uh, I've already said that orally, okay? This is just uh, a slide for you to have uh, in your in your studies, okay? So basically, the other one was, was good on the average. This one is, is good, okay? Uh, we use, again, here, so it's a, a deterministic objective function just for one indicator, okay? So I, one indicator for one model. I'm not simulating n models at the same time. So I have one optimal strategy for each RM. So the optimal strategy for each, this one can be very bad for the other. And this is, doesn't happen with the robust strategy, but unlike the robust strategy, here I have optimal solutions for each other. And this is, this is very important for decision analysis because I can quantify these different possibilities I have to develop my reservoir, and I can, have, I can quantify that. And this, this is very val valuable to us. Okay, so basically, um, the, the last part of the presentation I have here is to talk about the three main actions to, to manage uncertainty. And the, the previous strategies are very important for us to choose between these, these three main groups of actions, okay? They are summarized as I have here information, flexibility, and robustness, okay? When we talk about information, okay, it's a information, I mean, acquiring new information. So I have information, I have a certain number of wells drilled, I have seismic, I have um, lab data, I have all that. And the idea is that, okay, I have my knowledge, the, my this data, I don't think it's sufficient to make a good decision. So before making the decision, I will delay my decision and I will go and invest in more data. I will buy more data, it can be a new well, it can be more seismic and so on. Uh, so that I can reduce my uncertainty. This is one way to, to, to treat uncertainty. The other way is with the approaches of flexibility and robustness. Here we, we see this as a way of protecting the, the production system, okay? So instead of going and target the, 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 the uncertainty in itself, I will make actions in my production system so that I can make it less sensitive to uncertainty in, in the way that it can perform well regardless of the reservoir scenario we want. We have two main ways to do it with flexibility and with robustness, and we will see the difference shortly. And again, when we see about these three approaches, um, we are always thinking about those two concepts we saw before, exploit upsides and mitigate risks, okay? so. Ideally, we, we see both, but depending on the profile of the company, they can prioritize one or the other. So here, I have here just a, a couple of information for you to, to read later, but the idea is that when, uh, as I said, information, the decision to develop is usually postponed, okay? It cannot technically be postponed, but the idea is that we, I will spend more money in new data 
And the idea is that I can use that data to potentially reduce my reservoir uncertainty and potentially improve my decision I would make, okay? So an example is an appraisal well, form well testing for the seismic and so on, okay? Uh, and, but it's important to note that information has a cost, okay? So we need to also think about that, okay? When you talk about robustness, okay, now in flexibility, the difference I haven't said before and that I will explain now is that a robust strategy by definition is something that I don't need to change anything in the future then, and it will perform well on average, okay? So I choose a system that regardless of the true performance of my reservoir, it will perform good on the on the average and on the mark I have defined, okay? I need to define robustness to something, okay? For example, robustness to production, which if I want to achieve a certain level of well recovery, I need to be like more aggressive with more, more wells. If I want to achieve a certain economic return, I can be more conservative and invest less so I can make sure that I'm, I won't lose all that money. So basically the robustness is that I, I define a target, what I want to achieve, and then I design a system that in itself, it does not need to, for me to modify it later, it need to perform well, okay? Uh, when you talk about flexibility, is it a different way to protect the system against uncertainty? Here, my system can adapt, okay? And this is a, an idea uh, of flexibility, is to split the decision uh, over time, okay? Instead of deciding everything today, I will leave margin for in the future, I change uh, things based on the knowledge I will gain with time, okay? So when I learn more, I can, okay, I have a, a platform with some available well slots in case I have, uh, I want to drill more wells, I have the, the flexibility to do that. So basically there are, there are different ways, intelligent wells is also a, a, an idea of flexibility. So I invest, the idea of flexibility is that I invest, it's a system that is usually more expensive, but in the future, I can potentially uh, make use of that uh, flexibility, okay? So this is a different way to, to, to treat the problem. So all these, these three ways, so they can be seen as complementary, not as uh, competing. They can compete in some ways, yes, uh, but they can complement each other because the problem is very complex and it's very unlikely that one thing will solve all our problems and all our uncertainty. For example, if you see about uncertainty in oil price, if it's very, um, if it has a, a very strong effect on the decision you make, for example, if the oil price is high, you will drill 20 wells. If the oil price is low, you will drill less wells because it's well, it will don't have so much margin. Uh, you, there is no information that you can buy that will give you that. So you need to use other ways. For example, flexibility is a good way for, to, to, to manage uh, uncertainty in oil price. So depending on the uncertainty you have, you can see these as approaches as complementary and having like a, 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 a complementary, even though they can compete with each other. That's why we need to estimate the value of each one. Okay. So talking a little bit about information, Sorry, oh, talking a lot. Uh, so basically, uh, as I said, what I want to talk about the information in this slide, so it's a lot of text because I want you to read later uh, when you're studying. But the idea when I talk about information, it's actually a very broad uh, concept and can actually mean actually acquiring data, which is the most common thing you will read in, in the literature, but can also mean hiring a consultant's team, for example, if you hire if you already have the data, if you're, uh, for example, this can be more common for an operator uh, to have, um, they have their own in-house team of engineers and so on. They do the tests and they analyze and all that. And then they hire a, a, a service provider to have like a consultancy and to, to, to process again data and to analyze the data with different eyes. That can be also seen as acquiring information because you will invest, it's expensive, okay? But you hope that you can reduce your uncertainty or at least so understand better your reservoir and you can make better decisions, okay? So the important thing about in this is that you, um, you need to understand that, again, there is a cost. It can delay production. And again, remember NPV. 
So in NPV, if the time value of money counts, and if produce if I if according to NPV it's better to produce today than tomorrow, uh, if I will delay production, it will have a very in big impact on my NPV. So this is also so important. That's why we want to use what is called uh, if, if, if expected value of information analysis, or sometimes you will see just value of information. We use the E, uh, the term expected, to just to emphasize that we are estimating the value of information before acquiring it. It's not like I've already bought and now I will just confirming how much it, it was valuable to us. The idea is that I will, before acquiring information, I will do some analysis and understand if uh, this uh, information is valuable or not, okay? And one way to do it, so it's the most simple way, but there are other ways, is to estimate the MV with information and the MV without information. This delta will be the expected value of information at how much you want, you could pay for this new information, okay? Um, the idea here is, okay, is that I said, okay, but I'm going to estimate the value of with information before having information. So we use this concept. Uh, it's uh, uh, from Bayes, okay, Bayes theorem. It's also used in other areas of research. But the idea is that we want to understand that uh, how my information will change my perception of of my of my of my reservoir. Okay, and here is important to talk about the concept of perfect and imperfect information. Remember that when we talk about information, you cannot observe directly the reservoir. You will do some tests, it can be drilling a well or seismic, and then you have to interpret the tests, okay, to understand and then translate it into reservoir engineering properties, into porosity, permeability, and so on. So information is almost never perfect. You, you understand that seismic has imperfections, it had, can only has an accuracy of X percent and so on. So it's important to talk about perfect information. Perfect information is that it's, I acquire something and it, I completely understand, I have no more uncertainty after having that information. And imperfect information is that it's not 100% reliable. So uh, for example, it can have like a false positive and a false negative test. This is a good example. So we use this idea of information and this equation, we don't need to, to go in depth into the equation. The idea is that we use this idea of how perfect or imperfect information is to estimate how this will impact my probabilities and then again estimate the value of information. Okay? Uh, some also important concepts in the expected value of information is that we talk about the prior okay, or current probability is the probability we know today with the knowledge we have now and the information we have today. For example, I took this example from this book. It's a very, very good book. Um, it's, uh, for example, we have, for example, today we have a 30% chance of the original oil in place being low and 70% chance of being high, okay? The reliability, okay, is the e efficacy of the information to predict the outcome. For example, when the original oil in place is known to be high, seismic data correctly indicates high 80% of the time. Okay, so how reliable is my data given that my, my oil in place is low or high? And then we, the, the third important part of, of my, my, my data that I need to estimate my, my NPV, my uh, expected value of information is the project values, okay, in terms of money, okay? So, I mean, here the question is, okay, I have, this is a very simple example. So my original oil place can be low or high, and if it's low, I will choose one platform, and if it's high, I will choose another platform, something like that. So this is, I need to understand how much it costs uh, each one of these decisions, okay? And then we use to model this problem what we call a decision tree, okay? It's different from the derivative tree we saw before. The derivative tree was purely probability. So I was combining everything with everything because I was just talking about uncertain attributes. When you talk about the decision tree, we have a combination of two nodes. One that we call a decision node and the other one in yellow, it's the chance node. So the decision node is something that the decision maker can control. It's, there is no probability there, okay? For example, here, 
invest in two platforms in one platform or abandon the the prospect okay go do not declare commerciality and, and uh, leave the, the, the prospect so basically um if i choose uh, so this is my decisions then i have here it's original in place is high medium or low here is a chance node i cannot control if the volume in place is high or low right so I have here the three possibilities, okay? Each one, remember, we had the NPV, okay? If I have two platforms and the volume is high, uh, my NPV will be 800, okay? If I have two platforms and the volume, turn, the volume turns out to be low, I will lose $250 million, okay? So, and this is uh, the idea to model the decision tree, okay? Is a way to... to to put in paper, okay, all of these ideas, because this is a quite complex process because we have decisions, we have probabilities, okay, and we have chance, okay. Here, we have no information yet. It's just the, the idea of, okay, given the current and certain knowledge, I have these three values, okay, I have the probability of each occurrence, I have the EMV, right, which is the weighted average of the NPV by the probability, and I go for the one that has the maximum expected monetary value. In this case, it's just one platform, right? So if I choose one platform, I have an EMV of 360, right? But this is the expected value on average. But if the volume is high, I get 600. If the volume is medium, I get 400. And if the volume is low, I, I lose money. But on average, this is the best choice I have given today, okay? The idea when we go about um, acquiring information is to see, okay, but if I know before deciding on how many platforms I'll buy, if I know at least with better uh, um, probability, which one is most likely to occur. And that is the, 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 the thing we do with value information. I will, we will play with these probabilities according to the, to, to, to the reliability of our information to see how the decision will change. So basically, this is, this is from the paper. This one is here, okay? This is just a very, very complex, okay, tree. Uh, the idea is that uh, I, you can read it carefully later and then ask me if you are interested in this area. But the idea is that I will now, given, again, my uh, reliability of my information, I will use that equation from Bayes and change my uh, my probability table. Now I have, a, remember that the, 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 the tree was just a, a chance, no, decision not in a chance, so I'll choose two platforms and this happens. Now the tree is much more complex because now I have the chance of the seismic information, which is the one we are considering acquiring. I consider acquiring 3D seismic to reduce this original in place uncertainty. So first I cannot control if the, the result of the seismic data, if it's going to predict if it's high, medium, or low. So I have a chance not. So if seismic predicts that it's high, what will I do? I will buy two platforms because this is one the one that has the, bad, the, big, the highest EMV. So the idea is that we will, one by one, according to each one of the possible outcomes of the information, in this case, it's seismic has three possible levels, predict high volume, medium volume, or low volume, I will see which one, now I have changed the probabilities, right? Because if the probability says, if the seismic predicts that the volume is high, I have a much more higher chance than the volume being high, right? When it's seismic predicts that it's medium, the volume is medium, I have a much more higher chance at the volume being medium, okay? It's not perfect. If it would be perfect, I will have here 100% chance and 0% chance of being high or low because information would be perfect. But here it's not the case, right? So basically, what we do is that we uh, we use this, this this structure to understand better how I will do my decision, and ultimately, what I want to answer is two questions. First, depending on the outcome of my information, will I change my decision? It seems so because if the information says it's high, we'll choose two platforms. If it's medium, it's one platform, and if it's low, it's one platform. So I have different decisions. Okay, this is the first criterion. It's met. The second one is the, the expected value of information. So I had first the decision tree, the first we saw before, which I, I had a, a value of 360. 
And then I have to compute the value of this tree, which is not our focus today, but I would get the value of 389. So the delta between the two is 29 million. So if the cost of, for this, of the 3D seismic is lower than 29 million, I should acquire information because it will be valuable. The, the gains I will get from my new decision are higher than the cost of acquiring information. Okay, this is just an example. For flexibility, the, the idea is similar now, but now I'm not talking about uh, acquiring information. I'm talking about a, a system that can change, okay, uh, with, um, with time. So basically, as we said, this is just something I have said already. This is just for you to, to consult later, so I'm going to skip it, uh, except for the last part, okay? So basically, it's something very similar to the one before. So we are, now we are having expected value of flexibility, but it's the same idea. I will compute the expected value of my project with the flexible system, which is much more expensive, but also with the chance of changing the decision over time and the one with no flexibility, okay? We use, again, the same idea of the, the decision tree, okay? A uh, very simple way to model the problem, but a very useful way. And we have here, uh, again, the chance node, okay? In this case, uh, in this example, again, from the same paper, um, we are managing aquifer strength risk, okay? Basically, we have uh, the three possible options, I injection, uh, pre-installed, okay, no injection or flexible platform, because if uh, the, the, the aquifer was strong, I would require no injection, but if the, 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 the aquifer was medium or weak, I would require injection. So in this decision tree, what we are comparing, three the three possibilities, and it's a decision I choose, right? I can choose injecting from day one, okay, up front, all the equipment is ready, okay? I can choose having no equipment at all, or I can choose to have a flexible system that I have the ability to install the, 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 the an upgrade and install the injection capacity. This is, again, a very simple example. So basically, again, the same structure we have. If uh, I, I, I choose what I, the person I, I choose, but what happens next, I don't choose, right? If the aquifer is strong, medium, or weak, I, I do not control. However, when we have a flexible street system, it gives us the option to react after I learn about the aquifer. So in this case is here, which is called rigid systems. Uh, if I have either uh, injection from day one, and if I turn out to be, to learn that the aquifer was strong, and after all, I didn't need it, I, I have no choice. I already bought the equipment, it's in place. The same thing for no injection. But in the flexible system, the idea is that after I learned on how strong the aquifer is, I can choose to do the upgrade or no upgrade, okay? So in this case, if I have a strong uh, in strength, I would need no upgrade, okay? And if I have a, a medium or, or weak, I will do the upgrade. So I have, again, first criteria met. I have, depending on the, the, the outcome that I learned about the reservoir, um, I will make different decisions. And the other one, I did the delta. Okay, this is the equation here. All the details are in the paper and it's uh, 31 million. So basically, uh, the second criteria is met. I'm paying for my system and I have the, the possibility to be using that flexibility, okay? This is another example that I will leave for later. Uh, so last, we have robustness, okay? So basically, robustness is the third way to think about the problem, okay? So first information, I do not decide now, okay? I buy information right now, and then I will choose a system. In flexibility, I choose a system now, and I wait to learn about data that was already going to, to, to come anyway, right? Remember, the closed loop and the red part, I'm always updating my models. So it's important, specifically today in this in this pre-salt project and so on, to have flexibility in place because I, I the uncertainty is so high that it's good to be able to modify my system to cope with that. And lastly, we have robustness. Okay, as we said, robustness is another way of protecting the system. Okay, and unlike flexibility. Robustness is a passive way to protect our system. So flexibility is like an active way. I react as I learn about the reservoir. In robustness, it's 
uh, and like that. The system as it is from day zero is designed in a way that it can uh, cope with uncertainties. Uh, but again, we are talking about average, okay? It will not be perfect for anyone. That's why flexibility can add more value, right? But uh, it will not uh, uh, cost so much as flexibility. That's why we need to study, okay, which one, which indicator and which action is best for each uncertainty, okay? So we saw robustness, robust optimization, okay? where you do everything together. We run your optimizer using RN models, okay? But we can also get um, one strategy that was optimized in some other way and understand that how it is and use some indicators to see, okay, this platform looking at all the scenarios is way too big and it's over dimension or it's too small. So we can do that as well. So not only robust optimization, but using some indicators to improve your strategy. But the first one is far more, more common in the literature. The, an example of robustness, this is like a textbook example from this paper here. Uh, so this is a campo, a, a, a field from Petrobras. Um, and uh, this was, the, op, the, this was the, the field. And they had here a fault, okay, that was really in the middle of the reservoir. And they were not sure if the fault was transmissible or not, or ceiling. So basically the chance of being transmissible was much higher and the best solution given the, the fault of transmissible was to put all your all, all your producers in one side of the fault and all your injectors on the other side the the chance of having a, a transmissible fault and is doing right it was it was high but in case of the uh, that com comes again the low probability but high impact events if this happens to be the case that the, the fault is ceiling even though it's low probability it has a huge impact if i make this decision because i'll be pressurizing one sector of the reservoir with no production and i will be draining another sector with no pressure maintenance okay so that's why they they thought about this robust approach okay when they put some pr producer injectors in both sides of the fault okay so they are not the optimal okay but it would perform good in both sides in both scenarios of the reservoir okay this is uh, the npv for each one okay so the optimal solution you had a very good npv in the optimistic case uh, a, a, a more pomodic case also very good but a very horrible npv very very low for the pessimistic case when you go for the robust solution you see you get a very similar NPV for the three levels of the fault transmissibility was uh, this example. This is the idea of robustness. Um, basically, I have repeated slides, sorry. Yeah, okay, I remember this, okay. I, I will leave this for you to later. It's just a detail of one of our papers, okay, from Luis. Uh, it's one of our uh, PhD students. He compared, okay, the performance of robust optimization with uh, uh, nominal optimization, okay? And here are the results, okay? I'll just leave you for, for your curiosity, but the idea is what we have seen before. The nominal optimization will give you the optimal uh, solution for each one of the RMs, while the, the, the robust uh, one will not be so good for each RM, but on the average, it will be the best one. Okay, so just going to the concluding remarks, uh, I, I will sum up using the 12 step uh, flow line. Okay, so we focus more on the, the, the steps I have highlighted here. Uh, the first one we saw that from the reservoir characterization team, they will characterize all our uncertainties, so the range of, of values, meaning the interval, minimum and maximum, the shape of the PDF all the justicializations, they will do all that, okay? Then we saw that we need to use some statistical sampling tool to convert this uh, information into something that we can use in our simulator, which is uh, uh, our scenarios, right? We saw that Latin hypercube sampling was the most efficient way to do it. Then we saw that we do a first risk analysis, okay, with the first initial strategy. This can, we, we are debating on how to do this, but the idea is that we have just an initial estimate of my performance so that I can select my RMs, okay? This is the important part. Remember, we take these, we will use these uh, to select our RMs. And the RMs are very important for two things, as we saw. 
We saw that we can use them to optimize nominal production strategies, which are like specialized solutions, like optimal solutions for each one. And that can the decision makers can understand precisely how um, the best decision is for each one of the strategies, okay? For each one of the scenarios, sorry. And then we also saw the robust optimization, which we have one best solution uh, to one solution that is good on the average of all our models, okay? Uh, and what we have, what I have not shown here today, because it, I would like to talk a lot of other four hours, is how can we integrate these um, production strategies and make like some good decisions and to understand which is the best way to go, uh, either for flexibility, information, or robustness. This is something that we worked on in my uh, PhD thesis. And we are still working on it. It's, it's something that is very complex and difficult. But the idea is that uh, we are still researching and improving the, our methods is that how can we uh, use this information I get from these strategies and how can I uh, use it to uh, make objective decisions on the type of flexibility I need, on the if I need information, if robustness is the best way to go. Basically, this is a, the concept we have developed is using these uh, I can see, for example, if the number of wells is very similar between all my strategies, it means that I don't need to do much. The number of wells is clearly uh, something chosen. But if the number of wells is very variable between the, 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 the production system, maybe I need to choose something like, okay, uh, a flexible system with the ability to, to with have an extra well slot, something like that. Uh, if, for example, if I see that the well placement is very different from between the reservoir scenarios, I can go for robust optimization for well placement and to choose one well placement that is good on the average of all my scenarios. Or I can see maybe if I need to apply more data. So basically, the idea is that using this procedure from the 12 steps, we go to step 11, okay, and combine all these, okay, so the risk analysis, uh, the production position and the uncertainty to go to decision analysis. And that's where we're going to learn about and study all about information, flexibility, and robustness on how can we use and combine these tools to um, to get the most out of our, our, our project. And at the end, we go to a final risk curve. This is an example of how uh, in, in three steps we evolved, okay, the risk curve. We started from an initial risk curve, which is also an initial estimate of the risk, but doing all these procedures that uh, Professor Dennis has proposed uh, in his uh, method, uh, we can improve so much our decisions. And sometimes, I'm not sure if you have experience in company or not, but many times these steps here are not so common. Many times people, uh, at least in the past, worked a lot on the base case, so we have a very good solution for the base case, but the other side of uncertainty was not so explored. Now we have seen more on user robust optimization, but still we still think that robust optimization alone is not sufficient or may not be sufficient in most cases. In some cases, probably will, but in most cases, we see that it's not the true. So uh, we proposed all this uh, and to see how the uncertainty evolves. So to conclude, now just some, some sentences to, to help you guideline your studies later. So we saw that decisions in the petroleum field development are complex. Okay, we saw that we have multiple sources of uncertainty on the one hand. Then we have multiple decision variables and there is a complex integration between the uncertainty and the production strategy. We also saw the importance of numerical reservoir simulation because it has the unique advantage of uh, allowing us to model and get other forecasts of considering integration between the reservoir scenarios and the production strategy. And we also saw that process simplifications are required to make analysis feasible. And here, the RMs, uh, for us, it's one of the best ways to do it, okay? Because you will reduce substantially the size of your ensemble and you still maintain all the model fidelity. So all you can don't need to simplify your grid and so on. You can maintain, and this uh, is not the focus of so much today, but the idea is that it's, for us, one of the key ways to go for a uh, uh, simplification. We saw in risk analysis, okay, we saw the estimate probability, econo uh, probability economic production injection forecasts, okay, scenarios are generated in such, okay, yeah, we saw that uh, we need to use some statistical sampling techniques 
to uh, get uh, our, our scenarios, okay? We saw that there are different ways to do it, but uh, from our studies, the discretized lack in hypercube with just statistics is the one that ensures the most reliable results at minimal computational and human efforts. Again, human efforts comes in as how complex the method is, how many analyses it needs to make, and we saw that this method is very efficient, okay? We saw that accurate uncertainty quantification is key to assess production strategies and uncertainty. So remember, we saw these three indicators for overall uncertainty, downside risk and upside potential. So if your, your, your indicators are not uh, translating correctly what you want to quantify, you can make some uh, biased decisions just because you're not using the good indicator. So we saw that as an important part of the process, okay? Uh, sorry for the dog barking, it's from my neighbor. <laughs> Risk analysis only has value if decision makers assess actions to manage uncertainty and improve decisions. This is also a very important message that I want you to, to, to store, uh, is that we only do all of this process to improve decisions, okay? If, if it's just to know, uh, there is not much value in that, okay? At last, we, we covered decision analysis, right? We saw tools, uh, these are tools to manage uncertainty. And we saw that there are different ways, and depending on the, what you want to do, if you're more focused on mitigating risk or exploit the opportunities of the project. Uh, and we saw that there are two, three big classes of ways to do it, information, flexibility, and robustness. Uh, we saw that the, all these actions, ma many of them have uh, costs, okay? So we need to quantify the value of these actions. We need to understand if they will be able to improve our decision or not, or if they have the the possibility to do so before investing into them and also to, to choose wisely which one is the most ac uh, adequate for each case. Uh, we also saw that the representative models, uh, we saw that the, using them to optimize specialized strategies can be a, a very good way because we can quantify the difference and the similarities between these strategies, okay? And we saw that this this 12 step, or I showed you, that this 12 step methodology uh, is a very uh, useful uh, method. And then if we go step by step, it's very systematic and also allows us to see how much further we can evolve if we consider all these recommendations in the methodology. Okay, I think that was all I had to share with you guys today. Um, if you had any more questions, uh, I think we still have a couple of minutes. Um, okay, I have a question from the you know, child. Navi says, in a nutshell, the 12 step proposal considers both optimal and robust position. Is it, I mean, robust position based on this amount of nominal? Yeah, yeah, you're right. The methodology today, we see them as complementary. We, we have not yet found a way to do just one way. Uh, we are studying how can we speed up the process, but today the, the 12 steps consider both because you see them as complementary because the information you get from one are not the same as the one you get from the other. And you also comment something important. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you noticed in the slides, but I put RM robust optimization, RM nominal optimization because it's a simplification. I'm using robust optimization for those RMs, because I'm assuming that those RMs are good and they represent well my uncertain system, because the, the, in the perfect world, I would do robust optimization for the whole ensemble and I would do nominal optimization for the all scenarios, but there are no human effort available or computational tools to handle all that kind of information. That's why we do RM robust optimization and RM uh, nominal optimization. I hope I could clear your question, Davi. But if you need something else, you, are, you feel free to open your microphone too. Susana, I'll, I'll just stop the recording, but people feel free to ask more questions, okay? Okay, thank you, Professor. <laughs>